Good morning on this second Sunday of Pentecost. You're listening to a live broadcast from Lutheran Memorial Church in Pier. Lutheran Memorial is located at the corner of Nicolet and Prospect, just west of our city of Capitol Building. Our pastor here at Lutheran Memorial is Craig Wexler. Today's organist is Lori Kennecke. Hymn numbers this morning are 530, 521, 679, and 812. Our worship service is about to begin, and our opening hymn will be Dearest Jesus at Your Word, number 530 in the ELW hymnal. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. God provides the sunshine. When I came this morning, it was pouring rain outside. I looked outside and the sun is here. Amen? Amen. It's going to be a beautiful day. Um, glad to be here with you guys this morning. Glad uh, I see some of the Saturday crowd. I know this puts us a little out of joint. I get it. I get it. No, I appreciate you guys accommodating. We had a weekend of synod assembly and four hours of dance recital. Mm. <laughs> we are alive somehow, somehow. But... Glad to have you guys here, and, uh, and you know, holding prayer, all your dance families, I think they're probably sleeping, so, um, but um, just a couple quick announcements. You know, I've never announced this before, but if you're ever willing to do donuts on Sunday morning, let us know. I know one family has already approached me this morning. Uh, Amy will have the clipboard out there next weekend. Boyd has done donuts for years, but Boyd isn't always here. He's not always able to do donuts, so... And I love donuts. I'm going to make this totally a selfish plug. I love the donuts. I know the kids love the donuts. If you're willing to help with donuts or anything for that matter, um, just uh, see the clipboard in the weeks to come and fill that out. And that way we always have a little bit of breakfast snack and Pastor Craig doesn't go hungry. Amen? <laughs> no. Um, also, come in very quick. I know uh, Kelly and Amy have been putting stuff out there for communication, but coming very quickly, uh, not this week, but next week, the following week, uh, we have Vacation Bible School. So if your kids or grandkids are not registered, it's never too late. You can even register the night of, but for planning's sake, it's always a little bit helpful if we uh, register ahead of time. So um, if you are able to do that, we encourage you to do that. It's in the evenings, so um, it allows the kids to bring what energy they have left from the day, and we promise you they will sleep well each night. If you want your kids to sleep well at least one week this summer, bring them to VBS. So I'm um, glad to, glad to uh, announce that with you guys. I think that's what I'm going to leave it at announcements with. Let's worship this morning. Amen? I invite those who are able. Let us rise together. We begin worship as we always do. We come before God. We lift up our need of forgiveness and we hear his promised words to us. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. We begin with a moment of silence to reflect on our needs. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning is Dear Jesus, or Dearest Jesus, at your word, number 530 in a red hymnals, 530. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the peace, the victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. Let us join together in our prayer of the day. Almighty and ever-living God, throughout time you free the oppressed, heal the sick, and make whole all that you have made. Look with compassion on the world wounded by sin, and by your power restore us to wholeness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with this morning's readings.
The first reading is from 1 Samuel 3, verses 1 through 20. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Then the Lord called out, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm is Psalm 81, verses 1 through 10. We'll read it responsively. Sing with joy to God our strength, and raise a loud shout to the God of Jacob. Raise a sound and sound of timbrel, the merry harp and the lyre. Blow the ram's horn at the new moon and at the full moon, the day of our feast. For this is a statute of Israel, a law of the God of Israel. God laid it as a solemn charge upon Joseph, going out over the land of Egypt, where, he, where I heard a voice I did not know. I eased your shoulder from the burden. Your hands were set free from the grave digger's basket. You called on me in trouble, and I delivered you. I answered you from the secret place of thunder and tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you, O Israel, if you would but listen to me. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not worship a foreign God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians Four, verses 5 through 12. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let it shine out, let, 
Let light shine out of darkness. Who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. Please stand for the Alleluia verse and the reading of the gospel. shall we go you have the words of eternal life hallelujah hallelujah our gospel today comes from the book of mark mark chapter 2 one sabbath jesus was going through the grain fields and as they made their way his disciples began to pluck heads of grain the Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read that what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest, and he ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God's gifts given to you are the holiest of the church. God's gifts given to you come in different forms. Uh, uh, God's first gift to the Israelites came in the word called the law. The law was given as a gift. Let's not do away with that in the sense uh, of which we'd love to do, but the law was given to, uh, to humankind as a gift. And we say this time and again, and we remind ourselves that what the law was given, and when we say the law, of course, we come to the big ten. Oh, yes, Pastor, I remember that, the, the, the ten commandments. And if I asked us to recite them right now, each one word for word, that's when we'd probably say, nope, nope, I remember them, but I'm not going to go there. Amen? I remember the big ten. Well, how about all the ones in Leviticus and Numbers, right? The law was given to protect us from harming ourselves and to protect us from harming others. It was a gift given from God to us for all the right reasons. However, we, as human beings, have this innate ability of taking the gifts of God and turning them into something else. We take the gifts of God and we turn it into a system of sorts. And it's a system that even on the best of days sets us apart from those who become righteous in our system versus those who are just never going to measure up. Amen? This one in particular today, this morning we have Jesus working within this question 
of the commandment of honoring the Sabbath day and to keep it holy, right? And according to the law, it's corrupted now. His disciples who are hungry as they are walking in their mission field, uh, they are uh, walking on the edges of the field, which was normal. It's, a, it's normal that the disciples are about to grab some grain. In fact, it, uh, it also is in the law that, uh, that the poor are allowed to go into the edge of the field and take what is left, the grains that have fallen on the ground, or take the, the heads of wheat. In fact, if you as a farmer in agriculture in Israel were required to leave a part of your crop at the edge of your field just for that, for those who may be poor or those who may be hungry. Now, one, some might argue, some Bible historians might argue, well, the disciples certainly weren't poor. I mean, they're walking around with Jesus. They have what they need. Well, the reality is they are human beings that are walking with Jesus. They grab the heads of the grain, and they're rubbing them in their hands, separating the the kernels from the chaff, and what do they do? They pop it into their mouths. And the Pharisees, who are obviously in tail of Jesus and the disciples, watching every move. Notice, by the way, this is Mark chapter 2. Already we're hard at it, right? They're following him, watching everything he's doing, everything the disciples are doing, and according to their interpretation of the law, that moment they separate the chaff from the kernel, pop it into their mouth, they ought to be smited dead, amen? But yet they weren't. They get into this debate with Jesus. Why is it that your disciples, your students, find it appropriate to do what is against the law on the Sabbath? You aren't supposed to be in the business of feeding yourself. You were supposed to have done that yesterday. Because we good Israelites, we good Jewish people, we prepare for the Sabbath, and we do it the day before so that we do nothing on the day of. And Jesus gives them this great question, this great debate. He says, well, is it better to harm or is it, is, is it better to give life? Jesus, later on in Matthew's gospel, will have this encounter with the disciple or with the, the Pharisees again. He'll ask them, hey, what about your donkey? If your donkey is struggling in a watering hole, if, it, if he finds himself in the watering hole, hole and he's sinking, and that in your donkey, which is your tractor, so to speak, he is your assets to be able to do the work. If he's drowning, am I allowed to go get it? Well, yes, of course, certainly, Jesus. Of course. We'll find the loophole in the law. Amen? If there's anything we're really good at, we're going to find loopholes every chance we get. A colleague of mine this week, he was talking about uh, uh, something that uh, I never heard of before. I've got family in New York City, but, uh, and, and there have been times we've traveled over there, but I've never, I've never noticed this before. But um, a lot of people don't realize uh, Brooklyn, New York, is the second largest population of Judaism in the world next to Israel itself. And there are certain neighborhoods in these Jewish communities in which they have wires drafted down the alleyways and in front of the structures of the building. And those wires are there as loopholes to the law. Our Hasidic Jewish neighbors, because remember, the work of the church or the the work of God, it's not even lawful in the holiest of interpretations of Scripture For the holiest interpreters of the law, it's not even lawful for a mother to pick up their child on the Sabbath because that is considered work. So I love you guys. You guys are guilty right now. Right now, you're guilty. However, the loophole is that if you are within the confines of these wires, you are in your household. So if you're in the household, then it's okay to pick up your child. And if you're within the wires of this confine, then you also are within the household, so therefore you legally can pick up the child. Again, the loopholes. The loopholes of the law is what humanity is actually exceptionally good at doing ever since the fall They go into the synagogue. There's a man with a withered hand. Ironically, the withered hand 
earlier in Old Testament times. He probably wouldn't have even been allowed into the synagogue, but I imagine, again, we have another loophole in which the man with the withered hand is allowed to finally be present today. In fact, maybe the loophole is that the Pharisees let him in on this particular day to see what Jesus might do. In fact, it says right in Scripture that as they gazed upon the man with the withered hand, they were waiting to see what Jesus would do. What does Jesus do? Stretch out your arm, sir. Stretch out your hand. And what was accomplished? Healing. A gift of life. A gift to be able to do what you could not do before. Guilty! Guilty, sir! Guilty, rabbi! How dare you do such a thing on the Sabbath? That's what they wanted to say. You see, they didn't say anything at all because Jesus asks, what is more important? To kill or to let live? They're rendered speechless. And as Mark says, Jesus grieves their hardness of heart. He grieves that they choose not to give the answer that we as human beings with grace and compassion and love for someone ought to give in the moment. And what is their response? Immediately they leave and they plot against him. Chapter 2, folks. We have 14 more to go before he's hung and dead. All throughout the history of the church, we have these moments in which the law becomes corrupt. Oftentimes I hear today, even to this day, well, pastor, you know, Sunday is the day of church. Well, Saturday, folks, guess what day the Sabbath was for the Jews? Saturday. I guess the Saturday crowd got it right, amen? Therefore, we Sunday crowd have it all off and we miss the mark, right? Our Seventh-day Adventist friends, love them dearly, but we too have missed the mark because the Sabbath is the Saturday and that is the day, the only day that we ought to be here in worship. At Luther Memorial got really creative. We have Saturday night worship and Sunday worship which forces every single pastor to be guilty as charged. Amen? Especially when we realize if we ever view the pastor's role as not just uh, declaring the, uh, God's uh, gifts to you, but to be the servant and the employee of the church, then I'm definitely guilty as charged, and we get no chance at honoring the Sabbath, right? For me, the Sabbath is Friday. It's Friday, but what happens when someone passes away and the family's only need is to bury the dead on a Friday? And I guess we're guilty as charged again. But pastor, don't we remember the times in which everything shut down on Sundays? There were no restaurants open, right? There were no shops, they were all closed. I long for it. I think some of us, the old generation of duty and obligation, we long for it and we can call it a better time. I will say this, and I think Christ would say this, if the purpose of that was truly so that we could have respite, then kudos to you, because the Sabbath was designed for you. You weren't designed to abide by the Sabbath. If we were in that moment, in that time in the culture in which we were doing it to truly rest, then kudos to us for a day of rest. We also live in a a time right now where we absolutely have no such thing as rest. We're burnt out on both ends, amen? And we bring it upon ourselves. I don't say it as judgment. I don't say it as extolling those who aren't here because we're not resting, we're out doing things. I, I think what the, the problem is we're captured once again into the laws of the world. And when I say the laws, I'm not even talking about the Big Ten. I'm talking about the laws of what the world expects and for us to even be a part of it, to be a part of the world at this time in which we live, there is no such thing as Sabbath. There is no such thing as rest. And to which I think God is going to ask, is it better for our spirits to be killed or is it better for us to receive life? Where do we receive Again, back in the Old Testament, it's fascinating that we have this moment 
which the lectionary people got it right in their calendar and they gave us this text of, of the calling of Samuel. I want us to think about this concept of Samuel, a boy at this point in time. He is still but a child, right? He is a child that was promised to be given to the, church, or to the temple, or the, the tabernacle, in which he would become a high priest, he'd be trained. And there he is. It says in 1 Samuel that Samuel did not yet know the Lord. What does that mean? Imagine an acolyte who is in this church every single day, tasked with lighting the candles, tasked with cleaning the altar, keeping everything spick and span, learning and listening to the high priest, learning what it means to preach and extol God's word as a gift, and to witness it time and again, corrupted over and over again. Samuel had been doing this for years and did not even know who God was. Why? Because Eli, the high priest, allowed corruption to take place. His sons were now the priests. His sons were now in charge of the tabernacle. His sons were in charge of giving God's gift on each and every day. And it's become corrupted. Instead, what's taking place is extortion. Because your pledge envelope is not enough, I'm going to extort you even more because if you are to be righteous with God, you are going to give what I, the high priest, tell you. That is what's taking place. And in the meantime, the young ladies who are also a part of taking care of the offerings, the animal offerings for sacrifice, they are being extorted with their sexuality in their bodies. Literally, these uh, Eli's sons, the high priests, are involved in temple prostitution. And Eli, who's considered the senior righteous pastor, he just turns a blind eye to the works of his son. The Sabbath was given as a gift. God's word was given a gift. The Sabbath and the law wasn't given to you to decide how to corrupt it. Samuel does not know God. And Samuel hears a voice in the darkness cry out, Samuel. Samuel. What does he do? He runs off to Eli, thinking that Eli is calling upon him. And Eli says, it's not me. Just go back to sleep. And it happens again. And Samuel comes to Eli. Eli, you called for me. And he says, no, I didn't. At this time, Eli starts to pick up. Ah, something is happening here. Suddenly, Eli is no longer corrupt in body, mind, and spirit. He's connecting the dots. And he realizes, oh my, God is calling upon this young man. And so Samuel comes to him one more time. And Eli says, here, go lie down. And if it happens again, instead of coming to me, say, Lord, your servant is listening. Speak. To which Samuel listens. This little acolyte, he wants to know and he listens. And in the darkness, God approaches Samuel and he says, what is to, be, what is to befall Eli and his sons? The next morning, Eli says, did the Lord come to you? And he says, I, he did. Eli says, I want you to tell me what he said. What Samuel does is he calls out the corruptness of Eli. He's hesitant at first, but Eli says, you must not withhold I need to know what the Lord told you. And he said that you and your sons are going to fall. Amongst the corruption, amongst the laws being broken, amongst God's gifts being hijacked, God raises a prophet to speak the truth into the darkness and give light. Samuel becomes one of the greatest prophets of his time. Samuel flips the law back into gift rather than a broken system to be used against you. Today, we often use the laws of the church against people. We live in a time today, too, where the church is all across the board. None of us are innocent. We want to take the laws. We want to interpret the laws. We want to give credence to the law, the, the laws that help us understand who we are and help us be, are affirmed in our interpretation of what life is to be. And oftentimes we are taking God's gift and we're hijacking it for our personal needs. And it's what has caused so much division time and again. It's what's caused so many schisms and continues to create schisms in the church in the name of ourselves. Not in the name of the gifts of God. 
Brothers and sisters in Christ, the man with the withered hand, he needed light. In the darkness, his darkness, Christ simply said, stretch out your hand. And he was declared guilty for it. In our darkness, amongst my sin, amongst your sin, God reaches out with his word, and he was killed for it. As we go into debate as to what is the Sabbath, and we even to this day want to debate what the Sabbath is for. Is the Sabbath on Sunday? Is the Sabbath on Saturday? If the Sabbath is on Sunday, it's because the church declared that we worship on Sunday hundreds of years ago. And then some argue, well, the church did that to appease the pagans of Rome. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, the Sabbath was given as a gift to you to receive the words and the gifts of God. Amen? It is where we are reminded that we are broken. We find the loopholes every chance we get so that we can declare ourselves righteous, so that we can be right and everyone else can be wrong. And when we do that, we are the Pharisees themselves. The Sabbath is the gift in which we hear God's word proclaimed that the man who was declared guilty, the man who was killed, was done so so that we can have life, so our withered hands could be healed, so that the boils on our skin could be healed, so that our departure from God's goodness and his wish upon us can be healed, so that we can be reminded that we have new life instead of death, so that we, the donkeys, trapped in the water pits, are pulled out so that we can continue doing God's work on this earth. Everything else, all the loopholes, is a farce. But today we gather. Today you have the Sabbath. Today you have the proclamation given to you. Today we gather at the table and we eat of the bread. And we drink of the wine. We take the kernels in our hand, we separate the chaff, we are fed. And we are given the opportunity to do that for others as well. We come to God in the darkness. He comes to us with light. He comes to us to give us new life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of the day is O Day of Rest and Gladness. I hope the hymn number is right this time. Lori, is it? Are we good on 521? Number 521. I invite those who are able, let us rise and let us join together in song. Sure. 
church its voice of praises to you bless three in one let us join together with the rest of the saints of the church in professing our faith with the words of the apostles creed i believe in god the father almighty creator of heaven and earth i believe in jesus christ his only son our lord he was conceived by the power of the holy spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated at this time. Our ushers will come forward with the offering plates. It's our opportunity to give back to God what he has first given us. We will prepare ourselves for prayer and Holy Communion as well. Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Gracious God, we come to you this day and we ask for, for your forgiveness. Forgive even the church, Lord, at times in which we've taken your law that was given to us as a gift and we've turned it around for our personal gain and our own division. 
Forgive us and give us mercy and remind us what the Sabbath was for. Remind us of what the law was for. It was given to us to receive the possibility of being in care with one another and receiving care within ourselves. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, as we lift up on this, on this Sabbath day in the history of the church, Lord, we lift up all of those who need rest. We pray for the mental, physical, and spiritual sustenance that people do need. Gracious God, we pray that those who can't be with us today, that they may hear your word and receive your gifts in some way in the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious God, we lift up those in our community. We lift up all the dancers from last night. Uh, we pray that they can enter into summer at this time. We pray for the lifeguards down at the new pool. Gracious God, as we warm up this week, we pray for safety and care of those who will utilize that. We pray for those in the campgrounds and on the rivers. They too, Lord, we pray that they can be amongst your creation and, and receive your good gifts. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And gracious God, uh, we lift up all of those on our hearts and our minds this day. We, pray, we lift up those on our prayer list. So many have had surgeries and are at home now enduring healing and care. We ask for their rest and their provision. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And God, again, this week we are reminded of the consequences of our sin and war and bloodshed. Gracious God, we pray for all those servicemen and women. We pray for first responders that run into the call rather than away from it, Lord. We give thanks for them and we give thanks for their families back at home who hold them in support and prayer. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. All of these prayers, gracious God, we lift up to you in your name we pray this day. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink. He said, in this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. As we gather at this table, let us gather in the prayer our Lord first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Communion today is through intention. You'll be handed a piece of bread. Uh, we invite you to dip it into the chalice. The red liquid is the wine. The clear is the grape juice. Anyone needing the gluten-free option, that is front and center as you come through the line. All are welcome to this table. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. <laughs>
please rise. And may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and forever keep you in his peace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our sending hymn today is Faith of Our Fathers, number 812. This concludes our Sunday morning worship service from Lutheran Memorial Church in Pier. You can join us for worship on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. or Saturday evenings at 5.30 for our contemporary service. If you're unable to attend either of these worship services, you're invited to tune in to our live radio broadcast at 9 a.m. each Sunday morning here on KGFX 1060 a.m. or 103.1 FM or go to drgnews.com and click on Listen Live. Sunday morning services are also live streamed on our LMC Facebook page and you can catch our sermon podcast on either our LMC Connect app or right under our website under the Connect tab. Our radio broadcasts do rely on financial support from members of Luther Memorial Church and other regular listeners and viewers. If you would like to sponsor a radio broadcast in honor of a, a special occasion or in memory of a loved one, just contact our church office at 224-8608. So now on behalf of Pastor Craig Wexler and the congregation here at Luth Memorial, we extend our prayers to you and yours for God's care and guidance throughout this coming week. in God's word and its gifts on the Sabbath day. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.